So as I said, uh, how to get rich quick with JavaScript. So I present to you a new JavaScript framework, and together with it, an opportunity for you. It has all kinds of features. So it has XML, HX, SQL. It even has Wi-Fi. And it's licensed per app. So you pay 50,000 euros per app that you create with it. And per user that uses the framework, uh, another five euros. Pretty cheap. So we make a 70-30 split. So that uh, means you just create one app that has 100,000 users and you have almost half a million euros. Cool, right? Wait a minute. What conference is this? Or to put it more bluntly, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> OK, I have a confession to make. I lied. So this doesn't really exist. But imagine it would exist in this parallel world where our tools that we use to create applications would be licensed per device or per app or even per user. Imagine if for a moment if you used PhoneGap and you had to pay, let's say, 100,000 euros to use PhoneGap per app. Just imagine it for a while. That's not, that wouldn't be a nice uh, world, right? Instead, we have a wonderful world where you actually have free tools. And even more, you have ecosystems that are uh, created and enabled by those free tools. Think back uh, of all those great projects we have. We have Node. Look at the ecosystem around Node. Look at uh, the one around jQuery, our own Enio around PhoneGap. Look how much we have there. So just back about me. I work in the WebOS and Enio developer relations. And I love the web. I love communities and also mobile. So this is about the tools that we use to create our software. And it's worthwhile to go back and see how did we get here. So go back to the age of Metroworks, Borland, Clarion, and so on. There's actually Ben, I think he works for, used to work for Metroworks. Back in the days, those were sold to and used to by specialists. They were pretty expensive. 3,000 euros for a professional license. Or uh, if you were lucky enough to be a hobbyist, you might, you might have a uh, only to pay 200 euros, maybe. Oh, it's actually cut off, I see. But yeah, expensive tools and only used by specialists. And those were closed tools, no open source, proprietary licensing, which me meant that writing software uh, was limited to those specialists. And also, you had to actually find, uh, find someone to you have to pay someone to write you the software. I don't think anyone would just go out and say, yeah, let's spend 3,000 euros on software so I can do stuff. And as we marched on in time, this also led to a kind of vendor lock-in where we just said, OK, uh, this is the tool. This is uh, you have to use this. You have to update it to get the la latest feature. A few years forward, we started Back in the time, if you remember, uh, in the browser wars time, Netscape versus Internet Explorer, where the web started to rise. And you might remember the attempt to control this open web uh, to make it proprietary again. Rem do you remember ActiveX back in the days? So luckily, we didn't, end, we didn't stay in that uh, age. Because what actually happened was a democratization of the web, uh, the creation of software for the web, websites, those shifted from the specialist, which they were created in the beginning, to everyone. Everyone was 
uh, able to create a website, to create software for the web. What happened? The web was open source by design. It had built in a really cool tool which was uh, hidden in the menu and, um, and view source. So you could actually view the source of every website you visited. This led to communities. This led to open exchange where people shared uh, their uh, experiences thanks to view source. Because then you uh, said, well, I have nothing to hide. Here's my code. Look at it. Look how I made it. This led the web to become an ecosystem where we exchanged information, where we created tools built on the web, where we created services built on the web. It also meant that you no longer had to be an expert to program. The barrier of entry for programmers was really low if you look at HTML, CSS and, CSS and JavaScript and how they were standardized. So many people uh, could write software. The development tools were basically free. All that you uh, needed was a text editor and a browser, which both were free and available, even in source. At around the same time, you also saw that the infrastructure that built the web was starting to become open source. Languages, operating systems, databases, web servers, all this started to become open source. So let's fast forward today to today. We are in the age of mobile, clearly, if you look at it. Are we in the war of browsers again? Second coming? Well, it's probably more a war of ecosystems where we have everyone tried to uh, lock them in into their world, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so on. What's the role of the web in this mobile? First, we have the evolution of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which we collectively call HTML5. But we also have this ubiqu ubiquity. We have all kinds of connected devices all over the place that can access the web. And on the other hand, we also have this expectation of people that say, I just want to access my content, my data anywhere, be it in the car, on the phone, at home. The role of JavaScript also in mobile is important. It's ubiquitous. Every browser ships with JavaScript. And as we, say, uh, as we saw, uh, every device has a browser. It has even moved to the server. So we have client and server with the same language. And it's easy to learn. Which leads us to native versus web. Sorry, I have to talk about it a bit. I know it's like beating a dead horse. I'll do it anyway, but I'll try to approach it a bit from another direction. So my question is, what if, the web, what if web is native? What there, if there is no distinction between web and native? If you look at projects like WebOS, Chrome OS, Firefox OS that we saw today, there the web is native. What if all our, our apps um, uh, are on the web? Are we, are we still talking about native then? And also brings me to another topic. Apps must die. Why are we stuck in this? Why do we, like back in the mainframes, mainframe days, start an application? to do something. Why don't we do more just-in-time interaction? For example, I want to interact with something, be it a device or a service. So I have to go ahead and download and install an, install an app that's specific for that device. Then I use the app, and then I probably don't use it anymore. I forget about it. And then after a while, I have, after I've, after I've uh, used every service or every place on this world, I will have 1,000 apps installed, and I don't even know which one I have to start anymore. Why do we do this? Where will this end up? So what about I want to interact with something? I have an automated discovery that finds out what's out there. 
it will serve me a web-based app. I use it, I interact with that, I forget about it, and it's gone. And thanks to the web and thanks to all the infrastructure that's open, we'll have ubiquity. This is getting a bit off, top, off topic. So let's go back to the development tools that we have today. In mobile development, in mobile native development, uh, we have free tools. You don't have to pay for the development tools with Xcode, Eclipse, and so on, and so on. Or uh, also uh, Visual Studio. But are they really only an entry into an ecosystem of the, manuf uh, of the manufacturer? They're free as beer, but they're really do, you really, do they really give you freedom? Think about it. In web development, most tools are open source, and I mean that in a way of free and freedom. As I mentioned before, a low, uh, we have a really low barrier of entry for new programmers. They can go and start with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, as, and we have the browsers and JavaScript everywhere. We have a lot of communities around those products, around the web. And it's interesting to see good communities that form are, fu are funded on mutual respect by the, the uh, entity that puts out the tool and the one that uses it, because for both it means uh, respect each other and also voluntary engagement if I use it, or even if I commit uh, code to the project. Also, these days, uh, if you don't have a tool with a strong community, I don't think it has much relevance anymore. So with all that, in web development, the free tool ecosystem is key. So back to the beginning. One app, 100,000 users, easy, 400,000 euros. But now, you, s you uh, came here to find out how you get rich. Where's the money? The role of tools and frameworks is shifting. <coughs> They're shifting to become an enabler. So instead of sh uh, just selling a tool, you're using it uh, to sell services enabled by those tools. And we also see that a framework or tool becomes more than just a framework or tool because you start to offer support and consulting. You might uh, even offer an integrated development environment together with the tool or even a build environment. Think of PhoneGap Build, for example. Or uh, you might offer cloud APIs that uh, enable to do more with a, a framework or a tool. So this is where you can make the money. Let's look at some ecosystems as an example. I will look at three of them, PhoneGap, uh, Enio, our own, and jQuery. The ecosystem around PhoneGap uh, is consulting and also lots of services on top and for PhoneGap. Just look how how it has enabled us to write applications. And look how many big name uh, committers we have that contribute to the code. It's that here is the code, you, you can use it, and we give it to free to the project. Now think about it. If they had said, let's charge 100,000 for, for using PhoneGap, what would have happened? Nothing. It would disappear, no one would use it. Let's talk about our own framework. This is a sponsored slide, so you might not know what it is. Uh, it's a JavaScript framework called AnyoJS. It was open sourced in 2012. It uses the Apache license, so it is free as in beer and also in freedom. And its goal are to build native-like applications with JavaScript across platforms. I invite you to check it out. This ends the sponsored slide. Here again, what's the ecosystem about that, uh, around that new tool? Why 
should HP uh, not say, well, let's charge just that much for the license, and that's it. No, again, we say it's open source, and it's an enabler for us to provide services. And also, even more important, it, en it will enable other companies to build services and applications based on NU. Uh, there is also already a big community around it, where people, for example, submit their uh, compo components that they made for NU. And I, again, I have to ask if we would go ahead and say, yeah, you, to use it, you have to license every app you create, you have to pay that much. That wouldn't work. You wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it. jQuery, which is a bit an older project, just look what we have in terms of jQuery, how, how big the ecosystem is. We have jQuery, jQuery Mobile, jQuery UI. We have thousands of plugins. We have theming services. Again, the, the ecosystem around this is, is mostly on consulting and services built with on the top of jQuery. Again, if they would have decided back then, I think it was in 2006, to charge for it, what would have happened? I don't think people would use it. And look how much uh, it's used these days in how many applications, in how many websites. So to wrap up a bit, ecosystems by freedom, it's, there is so much more value than just selling a tool. You could say, okay, let's uh, sell a tool. We'll probably sell it to that many people. We'll make that much money. If you give it away for free and let it enable other people, just look at the the value of that is so much bigger than just selling it. And it's also interesting to see, uh, we'll have probably have not only uh, network effects, the more people use it, and the more people uh, will create services, and this will increase the value even more. So I urge you to keep the web development ecosystem free and in freedom. Open source all the things. Love the web, JavaScript, and be the community. Thank you.